By now, I am sure that you've read the new health care law. No? Apparently, Congress didn't read it either before it was passed. The over 2,500-page bill in large print is now an over 900-page law in fine print and in language making it very difficult to read. I know. It makes a stack of six inches. Let's look at what the law does. In the process, you may ask, what makes us an expert on the law when what we are saying differs from what the politicians in Washington are saying? Frankly, it is the history of the John Birch Society of more than 50 years of telling the truth. Not everyone has liked what we've had to say. The truth is not always rosy, but our track record speaks for itself. The law, called the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, establishes over 150 new agencies, making it the largest growth of government in our history. During the process of passage, many promises were made that all Americans would have medical coverage, it would be affordable, it would not raise taxes, and believe it or not, it would even lower the deficit. It was just too good to be true. They never explained how adding millions of people to the insurance rolls and paying for their medical bills would accomplish this. They never explained how building a huge new bureaucracy with working groups, advisory councils, wellness councils, and programs mandated for the first time in our history would not add to the tax burden. Promises. But then, when it comes to government, their track record of keeping promises is poor. Social Security is an example. We were told it would be voluntary, no longer. We were told that the maximum amount that we would be taxed would be 1%. Today it is over 15%, counting both the employee and employer taxes. We were told that the taxes we paid in would go into a trust fund, not spent as the general fund, not since the 1960s. There is no trust fund other than a paper entry. We were told that there would never be any income tax on benefits, no longer. We could go down a litany of such programs. Aside from the promises, Social Security is broke, Medicare broke, Fannie Mae broke, Freddie Mac broke. The war on poverty is a 40-year failure using billions of dollars per year. The Department of Energy, a failure, and so on. The government does not have a track record of making things work efficiently for the benefit of the American people. If past history is any indication, the increase in our taxes over the next few years will be very substantial. However, we need not worry. We are told that government has fixed health care and that it will be different this time. Everyone agrees that Obamacare is patterned after Romney care in Massachusetts. Romney care has set Massachusetts on the path to bankruptcy. Liberty and free enterprise built this country. Now we are told that only government can fix things. There is no smoking gun in this law. A smoking gun tells you where the shot was fired. This law is an enabling act, a loaded gun ready to fire, and you are the target. The impetus to pass government health care legislation is not new. It has been a process in work for several decades. As part of this process, certain politicians have blamed everyone but government for the problem of rising medical costs. The insurance companies, the medical facilities, the doctors, even the patients, the aged, for example. On the other hand, the solution offered has been government programs. As we have seen, government programs do not work as promised. In the case of medical costs, it is actually the government that is the primary reason costs have gone up. Here's how it works. Prior to passing the current law, the government controlled and subsidized nearly 70% of the entire health care sector, from federally mandated and regulated HMOs to Medicare and Medicaid, from the Department of Veteran Affairs to the Indian Health Service, and dozens of government institutes such as the National Institutes of Health, the Cancer Institute, the Heart Institute, and on and on. While invisible from the view of the average citizen, government regulation and oversight already permeates the entire system of medical care. From the insurance companies to employee benefits, from medical equipment and supply companies to hospitals, clinics, and medical personnel. It is the accumulative effect of costs, not only to comply with government regulation, 
It is the cost at all levels where medical facilities and professionals have to employ the services of people simply to read all the regulations as they change, implement them, and then fill out the paperwork, not to mention the taxes on the medical profession. Then the government increases our taxes to hire people to read the medical reports. Are you still with me? Government at both federal and state levels regulate the insurance companies as to coverage and cost. They also stifle competition between insurance companies by limiting the number of providers that can do business in a state. Competition always drives down prices. The lack of competition drives prices up. In the case of laws such as the Medical Improvements for Patients and Providers Act of 2008, Medicare supplement insurance is standardized, one size fits all, completely eliminating competition. The new health care law does this in spades and mandates regulating insurance coverage, business, employee benefits, and medical facilities. It also will regulate state insurance commissions. In the beginning, insurance companies will be subsidized. This is why they didn't object too much to the new law. However, in the end, it will mean total government-controlled medical insurance. One of the major reasons that health care costs have gone up is the passage of laws stipulating that all who go to an emergency center must be taken care of regardless of their ability to pay. This has been taken advantage of by everyone from the indigent to the illegal alien. In fact, it has been the illegal aliens using such facilities that bankrupted hundreds of hospitals in the last decade since hospitals could not pass on all the loss to paying patients. The problem was so acute in California, it threatened to close all the hospitals in the state. Go online and search out hospital bankruptcies. You will find 68 pages listing articles online about hospital bankruptcies. Instead of rescinding the laws, the government started to subsidize the problem by giving grants to hospitals to keep them open. And for all of us, taxes as well as costs continued to rise. And we have just given you an overview of the government's involvement that has driven health care costs up. This involvement has made an increasing portion of our medical professionals more and more an auxiliary of the federal government. The new law will complete the process. For businessmen, the law will be particularly onerous. In addition to fines for noncompliance, such as providing insurance for employees, the law also includes stress reduction programs for the workplace. OSHA started out as a law to ensure safety on the job. Only the authority, the structure, and the penalties were passed into law. The devil is in the details of the regulations set up by OSHA after the law went into effect. And these regulations change constantly. Anyone who owns their own business will be able to relate to that statement. It is the same with the health care law, except that the number of new agencies goes well beyond a single entity such as OSHA. We could get rid of one and still have over 150 new agencies to deal with. Incidentally, these agencies are so interwoven with cross-purposes that if one is eliminated, several more will still exist to continue the program for which the first one was eliminated. Everyone is concerned about themselves and how the law will affect them their business, their profession. The problem is not how it will affect any part of our economy as much as how the law affects all Americans. I'll mention two. First, the language in Section 1553 indicates that programs which include abortion, euthanasia, assisted suicide, and the withholding of sustenance to the patient can be federally funded. It is true that President Obama signed an executive order stating that abortion will not be funded. But he did not mention euthanasia or assisted suicide. And the executive order does not stop the funding of medical facilities or personnel that provide abortion, only the procedure. If a medical facility performs abortions, but also provides other medical or health programs, these may be funded, which in turn help fund everything done at the facility, including abortions. So stating that the law does not fund abortions is a half-truth. And 
Euthanasia will be funded if the language of the law is any indication. Today, several modern European countries that have government health care use euthanasia, such as the Netherlands, Belgium, and Germany. We simply cannot allow the government to support euthanasia or any other life-threatening procedure. Government cannot be allowed to decide when people live or die except for capital crime. Second, there is a program mandated to start wellness and prevention programs in the poor communities, which will then be used as a model to implement a national strategy. Sounds good, doesn't it? However, these programs mandate home visits with the testing of children and families, and the list of improvements the government wants indicates that they will intrude on every aspect of life in America from cradle to grave. In the health care law under Improvements in Outcomes for Individual Families, the government will institute local studies and experiments to be implemented into a national strategy all across the country. As we go through the list of improvements the federal government wants, while they sound good, think of the intrusion into individual families. That's you and your children. The improvements listed are prenatal, maternal, and newborn health, child health and development, child cognitive, language, socio-emotional and physical development, parenting skills, school readiness, child academic achievement, reduction in crime, reduction in domestic violence, improvements in family economic self-sufficiency, stress, both in the family and on the job, and more. Home visiting programs are part of the law. Think of how the government must come into every home to first gather information and then use that data to intrude on parental rights. The idea of school readiness and academic achievement provides the excuse for government agents to nullify parental prerogatives for private and homeschooling. Since they can test the preschool children, mold the tests of how and what the children should be taught, they can use this information to try and force you to send your children to government institutions. Government has never been a friend of the homeschooling movement. And given the social worker mindset, perhaps even take the children away from the home by calling parents bad when they are simply being resistant to government intrusion, which is their right to do. Once this program evolves out of localized studies and then implemented on a national scale as provided for in the law, the manpower required to implement this legislation will be legion. The initial stages are to be tested in the inner cities and poor areas. It will provide jobs for such organizations as ACORN or their successors. Historically, socialist activists gravitate to such jobs. Nationally, it will mean hundreds of thousands of government workers reaching into all parts of the country to implement the program and our taxes will go up accordingly. In order for government workers to come into the homes of America, the Bill of Rights will be trashed. The First to the Fifth Amendment will be violated. Since the workers will have the ability to recommend that family or child welfare services look at how you treat your children, and the possible ramifications of such a report, most people will be compliant, allowing in the workers in answering their questions. You will be intimidated from telling the government what you think of them, a violation of the First Amendment. They may ask you if you have a gun in the home, a favorite question asked by social workers. They cannot even be in your home without your permission, a violation of the Fourth Amendment. They will violate the Fifth Amendment by asking private questions of you and your children that may be used against you in the future. Was this debated on the floor of Congress? The legislation established a group to begin the process. It is known as the Interagency Working Group on Health Care Quality. It is composed of a mind-numbing array of government agencies, many of which we are sure you don't even know exist. By listing them, you will begin to see the intrusive nature of government into medicine even before the law was passed. As you look at the list of government agencies in this working group, Ask yourself what kind of politician wants this sort of government intrusion into medicine and your family. And more importantly, what do they intend to do with it?
Other groups the law mandates to be established to implement their recommendations include many of the aforementioned agencies and also these listed. Again, why is an agency such as Homeland Security involved? You can quickly begin to forget that this law was sold to us as a health care reform package when you see all of the government agencies that are to come together to tell us what's best for us and our children. In light of the Bill of Rights, the government agencies involved are indeed scary. This is the main problem with the law. It is the fact that it mandates a structure to run our lives. You may have an idea now why totalitarians of the 20th century were able to use socialized medicine to help subjugate their own people. From Lenin to Hitler to Castro, this has been true. The world's longest reigning communist dictator, Cuba's Fidel Castro, has roundly applauded Mr. Obama for passage of the health care legislation. Castro said, we consider health reform to have been an important battle and success of his government. For students of history, this praise should come as no surprise, because the man most responsible for modern communism, besides Karl Marx, Russian tyrant Vladimir Lenin, has been widely quoted as saying, socialized medicine is the keystone in the arch of the socialist state. Yet proponents of our new law said it would provide more freedom for the American people. For example, House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer stated that the health care bill he so strongly pushed will give patients, not insurance companies, greater control over their health care. Looking at the law, we already see that this promise will not be kept. While telling us that health care is liberation, it is the exact opposite. In fact, Congressman John Dingell of Michigan, an advocate of the law, sat next to Obama as he signed the bill into law, actually said, in a radio interview that the law will, quote, control the people, unquote. While he tried to explain away the remark later, the history of the legislation he has sponsored during his life is remarkably controlling. Hitler used the health care system in Germany to start a program of euthanasia of the aged and enfeebled. Within a decade, it had evolved into the death camp system. This is not an exaggeration. German doctors received their pay from the government directly or indirectly, and they were afraid to stand up and oppose the program until it was too late. Go online and research the eugenics programs of Germany and America, and you will be shocked. They are programs relatively unknown to Americans. One of the best DVDs on this subject is Maafa 21, which can be ordered from shopjbs.org. Healthcare in the hands of such people is extremely dangerous. We are not saying that the current administration is on this path, but why give them the power? Never forget that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Our country's founders gave us a system of limited government. We are in the process of creating a system of limiting the people and allowing the government to do anything. We have also seen a long-standing campaign in this country to bring alternative medicine and supplements under government control or even their elimination. From chiropractors to holistic medicine to vitamins, taking choice away from Americans. A few of the drug companies have tried to use government to further this agenda so they could have a monopoly over the use of supplements as well as drugs. Allies in this agenda, such as Senator John McCain in early 2010, sponsored a bill to bring vitamins and food supplements under government control. If the wellness councils are established, it is certain that these areas will come under government scrutiny as part of the health improvement projects. Nonetheless, the devil is in the details, as they say, and in the case of the new bureaucracy and law, the details will be in the regulations and procedures that the new bureaucracy will impose. One thing is certain. This is more of a control law than reform of health care. Is this the type of change that people voted for? When such government agencies as OSHA and laws such as the Clean Water Act were passed by Congress, it was the bureaucracy that dictated the rules, regulating industry, business, farms, and navigable waters. As to the latter, these regulations were rapidly imposed on all waters and the land on which water rained. 
well beyond the scope of the intent of the law, or at least the promises made when Congress passed the laws. It's time to get involved in a campaign to repeal not only the new law, but government intrusion into medicine all across the board. If we do not get government out of medicine, we will be right back where we were before the law was passed. If someone advocates that we need government oversight, that's what caused the problem in the first place. We also have to be careful of solutions that are not solutions at all. Replacing this government program with another is not a solution. Even if it is less intrusive, the history of laws is that they get bigger and more expensive, accomplishing less of what they were intended to do as time goes by. A little amendment here and there by Congress would simply give us what we're trying to get rid of now. We cannot be fooled into arguing against the health care law only on the basis of injustice to any one portion of society or by a regulation or two, or by eliminating a mandate. The entire law is bad. The manner in which OSHA became law was that once a few regulations were rescinded, major business associations said it is now a law we could live with, and the movement led by the John Birch Society to rescind OSHA was stopped. OSHA has been growing ever since. As part of the process of repealing Obamacare, there will be companies and business associations whose survival will depend on offering services and compliance related to the law. They will have a vested interest in seeing Obamacare go forward just as what happened with OSHA in the 1970s. We cannot allow ourselves to be convinced that we can live with a few changes in Obamacare that will make it livable. One of the schemes being promoted as a solution is an amendment to the Constitution to stop the law. The law is already unconstitutional. We do not need an amendment to tell us that. In fact, if we say it requires an amendment to stop it, we are saying that a lot of other unconstitutional laws as well are really constitutional when they are not. Besides, if government is already ignoring the Constitution, passing another amendment will not solve that problem. The only way that medical costs can come down, as well as taxes, is to get government out of the medicine business and allow free enterprise and competition to flourish. The John Birch Society has a campaign called Choose Freedom, Stop Obamacare, in which you can participate in part or total. But it is time to get involved or lose more of your freedom. The people showing you this DVD can help you get started. If you are viewing it alone, then go to jbs.org for further information.